I just want to share some personal. Is that okay with you guys? All right. Thank you. Um, well, I just want you to know this year has been like a crazy year. I don't know what your year has been like. Um, my past year has been filled with a lot of challenges, a lot of personal challenges, a lot of things that I was like, God, what? What's going on? A lot of things that was uh, affecting my confidence, affecting the way I was seeing things, and um, a lot of doubt being hit in my life and a lot of things based on those challenges. And I just cried out to God, and I said, God, what, what's going on? I feel like I'm being attacked on every side. What is going on? And God spoke to me, and what he spoke to me, I, I'm going to speak it to you tonight. He said, you're big game. He said, hunters don't get excited about praying on the weak. They want to attack something that's difficult to get, hard to take down. And church, I want to remind everybody tonight that there's none feeble among us. You're all big game in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So tonight, I'm going to continue on in what Pastor Derek has been ministering on, the love of God. When I tell you, I don't care when you talk about the love of God, love of God it's always an on-time word. Always. And for so many reasons, and tonight, I, I'm not going to share anything with you. No new scriptures. There's no new script. They're not making new scriptures to go on the Bible. I'm not sharing any new scriptures. I'm literally going to share with you the revelation I got hearing this word. And um, I'm really believing God to pursue him in a new way for the rest of this year. I'm not living on any past word, past understanding, past revelation. I need a right now revelation. I need a right now belief. I need a right now understanding. And so this is hot off the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so I'm believing God. It'll hit you like it hit me. Amen. All right. So I'm going to hold off on the title just yet. I'm going to give it to you. But our foundation scripture tonight is coming out of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And we're going to start in verse 33. Romans chapter 8. Verse 33, and it reads, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Hallelujah. It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? Yeah. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, tonight, we're going to live in the scripture a little bit tonight. Okay? So, um, if you got a little bookmarker, whenever we travel, we're going to travel right back to home base. So, uh, we're going to live in the scripture a little bit tonight. Uh, one of the things um, my sister taught me, my sister Nina, she teaches me um, all the cool stuff she's studying and all this stuff, you know, when she was going through Job and all. I'm like, well, man, word, that's cool, you know. She just sees the Bible in a, in a way that, um, you know, it's like a little classical. She just shows it to me in a whole other way. But one time we were talking about the word, and she said, you know what, Nikki? God doesn't waste words. So it reminded me to slow down when I'm reading these scriptures. Sometimes I could be glossing over something that God wants to jump out at you. So... Since God doesn't waste words, let's go back. Um, let's launch off from verse 38 because this is what jumped out at me when I went and took another look as, it, as the word was being ministered. Verse 38, and it says, for I am persuaded. And I thought to myself, well, Paul here is saying something in this scripture has convinced me. Something in this scripture has won me over and so much so that I am now persuaded that God loves me. I can't be moved off of the understanding that God loves me. So our title for tonight is Persuaded of His Love. Persuaded of His Love. 
I just think it's pretty cool that it's Paul that's teaching this and Paul that's going over these scriptures because Paul is the one with a serious past. And we'll delve in a little bit into that a little later in the message, but he, he's rightfully so the one to share this message. All right, so it prompted a question to me when I read that scripture. And the question was, how can I be persuaded to? So I believe Paul reveals through the scripture that there's three questions every believer must answer for themselves to be convinced that God loves us. The first question is the question of guilt. The question of guilt. And this is what we're going to go over tonight. The question of guilt. Number two, the question of condemnation. The question of condemnation. And number three, the question of love. The question of love. Three things we must answer for ourselves. Number one, the question of guilt. Number two, the question of condemnation. Number three, the question of love. So let's hop into it for tonight. We're going to hop in question number one, and we're going to return back to Romans 8, verse 33. And it reads, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Now, the cool thing about this is, you know, they're really just asking you, who can press charges against you? That's really what that scripture is saying. And if you know anything about the law, I am not a legal expert. My mama worked for the police department and all that stuff. That's as far as my knowledge goes. But I know that when it comes to pressing charges, you can't just say someone did something and somebody go arrest them. There has to be some kind of evidence, some kind of witness or what they call probable clause, or how I like to look at it is like, you probably did it. <laughs> it has to be something that they can lay against you in order to even bring charges. This is not for you to go to jail. This is just for them to even arrest you, for them to bring any accusation against you. Probable cause, right? So I want to revisit something Pastor Derek, he keeps referencing this scripture in the Bible, and it just, ugh, yes. We're going to revisit this woman in adultery caught in adultery, and we're going to look at um, this question of guilt. So John 8, John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 1, John chapter 8, verse 1, and Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. They got evidence. They bring an accusation. They got witnesses. Now, verse 5, now Moses in the law commanded us that we should stone her. But what says you? Oh, now they want to they want to bring condemnation, right? Verse six, this they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now, not only were they trying to bring accusation against God's elect of the woman in adultery, they were trying to bring accusation against Jesus, who is also God's elect. All right, now, verse seven. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and he said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Now, what Jesus is doing right here is he's appealing to their sin consciousness. He knows that the blood of bulls and goats can't, can't quite wipe away your memories of, yeah, but I did this and I feel guilty. Yeah, yeah, I messed up or I lied or I broke the law in some kind of way. I broke the, the I violated God's law in some kind of way. And I just, I'm always having this consciousness of sin constantly swirling in my soul. So when they continue asking him, and so he um, let them without sin cast the first stone. And again, he stooped down and rolled on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and he saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned you? He's addressing Where's the, who's laying an accusation against you? Can they lay an accusation against you? Who's condemning you? Do you see? Where, where, are you going anywhere? Are they taking you anywhere? There's no one here. And he's like, not only is the who not here, I don't either. I don't condemn you either. So 
one of the things I want to bring out about this is, you know, as we're walking with God, trying to just work out our own salvation in fear and trembling, you know, as we continue to learn, we, we start realizing more and more, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know that was sin. I didn't. I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to do that or, or I, I, I didn't know that that was a thing that was unpleasing to God. And if we're not comfortable, careful, excuse me, careful, we can start thinking that you were guilty. Now, I brought my diary here. I started keeping a diary when I first got born again because it's kind of how I talked to God at the time. And listen to the guilt conscious. I said... Well, if I can get my other page back over. They said, God, I'm trying to develop in my character, but I've learned that I'm a liar. I'm a snoop. I'm untrusting. I'm untrustworthy. I'm a gambler. I'm quick to anger. I'm emotional. I'm uncomposed. I'm bitter and I'm violent. Guilt conscious. Sin conscious. God's trying to show me I'm righteous. You can grow in this. I'm walking you through this. I'm growing you up. But all I could think about is, I'm guilty. Oh, God, oh God I messed up last week. I'm guilty, God. I lied to somebody. I knew it. I felt convicted in my spirit. I'm guilty, God. And God is, and God is saying, I'm the judge. I chose you. Who can lay any accusation against you? I made you right. It's just like you showing up in the courtroom and somebody saying, well, yeah, I caught them. I caught them in the very act. They lied. I caught them. I caught them in the very act. They, they took something that didn't belong to them in the refrigerator. They sure did. They're violating your law. And God is saying, you, I know you. You know me. I already said everything you did do, everything you currently do, all everything in the future, you're already acquitted. So who can lay anything to your charge? You just continue to keep walking with me. Take off the crown of guilt. I got a crown of glory for you. Just walk with me. Just walk with me. And it makes the e a little more ease when you're walking with the Father now. Because you're like, I don't have to worry about that. I'm not, blood, the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it, but there's another blood that can. So let's go and answer the second question. The second question is the question of condemnation. The question of condemnation. Mm. Verse, we're going to go right back to Romans chapter 8. Told you we're going to live over there for a little bit. Romans chapter 8. And we're going to look at verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know what kind of sense it makes <laughs> for us to feel condemned when it's like, well, Jesus died for you. Better yet, he even rose for you. Even more so, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's pleading and interceding for you. Yeah. So does it even make any sense that he would condemn you? So let's go to a scripture to kind of like anchor this down a little bit. If you could, please, let's turn to John chapter 3. And let's look at what it really means, this condemnation. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we're going to read verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. You hear that? We, are, we just saw some proof of that. When he went to see that woman and they brought him, well, he didn't go to see her, but they brought the woman in adultery to him. He was like, Do any, does anybody condemn? I don't either. I'm, I'm not here to condemn anybody. That's not even what I'm here to do. What is he here to do? But that the world through him might be saved. I'm here to save folk. I'm not even trying to condemn anybody. So, and he goes on to, this is Jesus talking. He's going on to expound a little more on it. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son. There's only one way to be condemned. 
You have to reject the one who died for you. Reject the one who rose for you. Reject the one that's sitting at next to the Father. You have to reject him. Condem condemnation is something to be saved out of. Nothing that's something, it's not something that comes on you. Verse 19, and this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Now, I don't know about you. Um, I don't know what your experience is like, but I, I just felt from a very young age, God just trying to get my attention, just very young. I just remember just these little conversations and God used to speak to me in dreams and all this stuff when I was very young. And I was like, mm, I, I don't know about this born again thing. I was just like, I, I'm too young. But really the truth was, I love darkness more than I love light. Yeah. Oh God, I'll serve you when I get older. I love this darkness too much, I can't let it go. Well, you know, I'm in a relationship I don't want to let go, and maybe if this don't work out, maybe I'll come to you, Father. I, I love this darkness. This darkness feels good. And the only reason people reject Christ is we love darkness more than we love light. Why? Because I don't need the light shining on what I'm doing and tell me what I already know is wrong. It's kind of like when you wake up in the morning. You ever been just sleeping good? I don't know about you, I like a dark room when I'm sleeping. I don't have a TV in my room, nothing. I like a dark room when I'm sleeping. But if somebody come and snatch them curtains out, uh, 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 I, don't, I don't want the light. Right now, I just want the darkness. It's a life posture, and people won't see it unless they come to the sun. Let's finish out the scripture. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Hateth it. That's some strong words. You hate the light. You hate that Jesus came into earth for you. You hate the salvation. Hated the light, neither coming to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now, this is interesting to me, because when I came to God, I won't say I was fully ready to go, but I was kind of convinced. I was very, very, very interested. I was like, ooh, I'm interested in you, God, but I don't know. I don't know. And then I was dating someone at the time, and I'm, I ain't going to lie to y'all, we were living together at the time, and all this stuff, doing what living together folks do, you know. And I'm like, God, I just, uh, I feel like if I get born again, we not going to be together. I, I, I don't know why I felt that way, but I just felt strongly that way. I was like, it's like something in me already knew, we're going to have nothing in common when I come to the light. So... I was sitting in a service one day and the pastor stood up and he was just like, somebody's holding back because of a relationship, but they won't be standing next to you. And I was like, oh, that's what I needed to hear, that I can go for myself. And I went up and I received that salvation and I was like, oh, yes, I, I felt the freedom. Instantly things were broken off my life. And I was like, oh, but as soon as I got going good in this salvation, God would just illuminate my life a little bit. It's like my life was a dark room, and then it's like, look at that. I like a spotlight shining on it. And I was like, okay, God, what, what you showing me now? I drank heavily at the time and all this kind of stuff. Um, I just felt like that's what you do. You get older, you turn 21, the next best thing is you start drinking. Not, it's not like a full desire, just the culture of the world. It's like a rite of passage. So I was like, so this is what I'm doing. And, and I felt God spoke to me. He's like, lay it down. And I was like, oh, 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 okay. So <laughs> I was like, you got to understand, I'm going to be real honest. I, like, I came from drinking every day to God asking me to lay something down. And so I was like, I'll lay it down for you. I'll lay it down. Overnight, no more drinking. Overnight, no more smoking. Now, I was driving in my car. Now, still, I'm still living. Me and my boyfriend still living together now. Now, I'm like, okay, God, I want to walk right. I don't know how to navigate this, so I'm just not going to tell him I got born again, and I'm just not going to say anything and see how that worked out. So uh, I don't know what I was expecting out of that, but eventually he was like, you got to tell me something. What's going on here? And I'm just like, man, I got born again. And, you know, he asked me, he's like, who told you you could do that? And I was like, oh, this is kind of like a, a personal decision. He's like, it's not because it affects both of us. I'm like, oh, well, oh, okay. So I was like, well, let's see how we can navigate this and make this work. So uh, 
I would drive down. One of my favorite things to do, I do it to this day, is I just like to crank up the music loud in my car and just play worship music just to get me amp, amp for the day. And I would drive and I would play the same song. My sister tell you, I, I wear something out. I'll watch the same TV show over and Look, my brother just nod and he's just like, mm-hmm. I, I don't watch anything new. I watch the same thing over and over and over. I listen to the same music over and over. I know what to expect. I don't like surprises. So <laughs> at the time, it was a Merry Merry song out. And that song was, if you tell me to go, I'm going to tell you I will because I love you that much. So I'm riding, be bopping in my car. Yes, that's my song. That's my jam. Because, God, you know, I'll do great exploits for you. If you tell me to go, I'll go. You know? And so I'm singing the song. And that's my, that really was my heart posture when I sung the song. And then one day when I was coming home from work, still playing my regular song, I heard God say, no, you won't. And I was like, well, oh, excuse me, my feelings a little hurt. What? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, he's like, that man is still in your house. I'm ready to do great exploits, skipping over the simple, the simple obedience, the things I know to do, but trying to reach past that for the spectacular. So I was like, I got to do it. It's going to be painful. I'm going to be scared. But when I go home, I got to say, we can't live together anymore. And you know what? (laughs) We had that conversation. We didn't live together anymore. And that was fine. That relationship was over and all that kind of stuff. And that was fine. But I would have never known what kind of relationship I really was in if God hadn't spotlighted it. If I didn't bring my deeds to the light so he could show me what's good and what's evil. When when we're renewing our mind, we don't know everything. We have to be led by the spirit of God. We have to be led by his word. We have to be led by the things that we're learning. And as we grow in those things and we be obedient in those things, oh, now we're growing in Christ. Now we're going in Christ. So now that the spotlight done hit a few things, that's a never-ending story. The spotlight continues for the rest of our lives. Yeah. It goes down to the things that we think are big to right down to the small thing. Me and my sister, it's, I would say it's funny, but it's not. <laughs> Me and my sister, we, know we never got along, ever, ever. And I was like, I know you're like, well, y'all twins, and if my mama was here, she could vouch. She was like, them girls do not get along. And we didn't. We had just nothing in common. My sister was born again at a very early age, very early age. And just like any light and dark situation, I just, I don't know why I don't like you. I just don't like you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so, you know, it just was a, a, a struggle for me. And literally, it wasn't until I got born again that we even had a relationship, like a real legit relationship. And it's funny that when I got born again and started going to church and stuff, I'd be like, hey, you know, because I was very sharp, like sharp, sharp tongue when I was in the world. You know, I I was rough and tumble. So it was like if I said two words, three of them was going to be cuss words. That's just how it was, (laughs) you know. So I would look at my sister and I, you know, I would say little slick things. And at the time in the world, it was just a very common thing that, uh, you call women out of their names at the time. About, it was just a celebrated thing. And I, I, I embraced all of that wholeheartedly, you know. And so I was like, oh, now I'm getting convicted. Every time I say something to them, I'm like, oh, and I'm like, but, oh, that sounded a little sharp. And I'm like, hey, I got to come to repent to you. And I'm like, I'm so tired of going to this girl every day. But, <laughs> but the interesting thing is not only my sister, but my family member was like, there's something different. There's something different. God was working a thing, working a thing. And guess what? The more I walk, the more I walk, the less guilty I felt. And the more things was rotten God in the light. And guess what? I, I was answering for myself the questions of guilt and condemnation just by simply walking with God. So we're going to move on to question number three. We've got a few minutes in here. We've got a few minutes. We're going to live in this a little bit. So if we could, please, number three is the question of love. The question of love. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to go right back there to home base. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Now, before I read this, it's so funny to me because I literally seek out songs that sing this scripture. And I love it. And when I say, (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm back up and say this. In youth ministry, we're memorizing scriptures, which is interesting to me because um, sometimes when you memorize a scripture, if you don't keep revisiting it, you'll try to throw in some things that aren't in the scripture. And some that's like, I noticed that I was saying this scripture completely wrong for a very long time. And so I always thought it said, what can separate me? That is not what the scripture says. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? Who? And that's smart at making me think, am I thinking about this scripture wrong? Am I thinking it's a thing and not a who? So verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Do you realize for any of these things to come into play, it has to come through a who? So we're not walking this thing out all by ourselves, and life is just not just happened to us. It, it, it's intentional. I love that the scripture that Paul is reminding us shall, shall principality. That's just one of the things that he li- shall principality. Why be, shall angels? Do you remember that the devil was an angel? And his fallen angels with him were like nothing more than the separation from the love of Christ. And I love that Paul is saying it's impossible. It's impossible. So shall any of these things separate us as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. (laughs) Another translation reads, we're seen as easy prey. And the funny, I'm going to return to this, but the funny thing about that is it's so true. It's so simple. It's so true. You know, I see my brother-in-law and like the number of times he gets persecuted just for being a stand-up guy. It started when he was very young. You know, when he was in high school and middle school and all this kind of stuff, he was a virgin. And you know what? He was also an athlete. And guess what? I'm putting your business out there, brother, but I know you are right with a man of God. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, because his last name is wu And so they would pick him. They would say, Wu-Tang, don't get no Poo-Tang. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so, but you know what? He was like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, David. I just brought all that back up. I apologize. But <laughs> anyways, past if I overstepped the boundary, I apologize. But, <laughs> but, um, but you know what? That's okay because they were counting him sheep as a slaughter. Yeah. They thought, oh, he, he's not living good. Like, oh, they're not going to have good. Like, they're not gonna, they, they, they just think that we're the less than because we're doing all this weird stuff. You know, I see him st- you know, working hard on his job. I, I've never seen anybody rise to the top more than this, than this guy or be given more TVs than this guy. Please don't give him a TV, nobody. But, <laughs> but he does little things. He, he's just an excellent guy. He, he started a brand new job, and he drives trucks and all that stuff. And when he took that truck, I'm telling you, he took the truck, he brought it home. He's, like, washing it. I mean, like, detailing his work truck. I don't know if you guys ever been in a work truck or seen it all that. It's nasty. I don't know how else to say it. It's a lot of stops to gas stations, all that stuff. So they're always throwing big sippy cups and all, whatever that stuff is called in there. It's just nasty. So he got in there, he cleaned it. And, I, and his boss came to like, who, who, who cleaned, who, who'd you get the details of this truck? Blah, blah, blah. He was like, oh, oh, no, I did it. He's like, like, you did it? Second day, you did it? When you got the truck? And just promotion, at the promotion. I think he got to raise the first week he was at work and all kinds of stuff and then I, they make standards of things that he does as a pattern and I'm just like just being his regular regular self but people see that and they get upset there's like we're just doing what God has asked us to do be be you know be excellent people be stand-up people do the right thing even if no one's looking now he's not doing that for you know thank y'all for the applause though but <laughs> he's not doing that to be noticed or any of that. He's doing that because it's in him. Yeah. And as believers, all this stuff that God is working in us and all of us at different times, we do it because it's in us. But people are like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to best them. Oh, you know what? I'm going to persecute them. Oh, you know, I think I'm going to take something away from them. They're Christian. They're supposed to forgive you anyway. You know, all this stuff. They see you as she, they see you as easy prey, ripe for the plucking. And I love that Paul comes right behind it. He don't even leave that thought hanging out there. He's like, no, in all these things, all that stuff you thought we were sheep to the slaughter in, 
we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. It's because of his love for us, his love that's in us, we're more than conquerors. Not just regular conquerors, more than conquerors. Amen? Amen. And for I am persuaded that neither death nor life. Can, can we take a moment to really think about what he's saying? That if you really sit down and think about it, death can't separate us from the love of God. Why? Christ Jesus already took care of that. Death, where's your sting? What are they be afraid of? When I was a little girl, I was so afraid of dying because I was like, what is that going to be like? What is that going to be? I was a little preoccupied with it because I had read it somewhere or something, something, something. And I was just like, well, what is it? But when I got the revelation that death has no sting, that it will not be an experience that I should fear. Why? Because even death, when we see our brothers and sisters around the globe, and it's heartbreaking to see the things that they have to endure, that people want to make them denounce Christ. And they're like, no. And I know you think that death is going to separate me. But I'm just separated from here. But I'm never separated from him. I'm just separated from here. And y'all, we got to keep praying. Not, I, we have to keep praying for our brothers and sisters all over the world. Yeah. Not just here. Not just our families. Not just our church family. Stuff is going on, and people need strength, and we are called to intercede, and let's intercede right with, with Jesus as he's up there pleading for us. Amen? I'm going to leave that alone because if y'all know me, you know I'll cry. So, <laughs> uh, um, death nor life. You know what? In life, there's just natural things that's going to come up. And I like that Paul, um, Paul in the scripture, he talks about um, nor present things nor things to come. I like that he says it that way because he said, I'm not only just considering the stuff that's going on with me right now, um, because sometimes we kind of have, have reactionary Christianity. We're just like, I'm just going along and then something come up. Oh, I need to handle that. You know, something going on. He's like, no, no, no. I prepare my heart for something that even in the future, should something come up, I, I, I want to make a pre-decision that it won't, that I won't allow it to get in my soul. I won't allow it to cause doubt of God's love for me. And so sometimes we have to sit back and when we have some quiet time or we're praying, we got to make a pre-decision. I was like, God, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen to people on this world, earth. And I receive every one of your promises that none of them happen to me. But if anything in the regular life that comes up, God, I make a pre-decision. You still love me. Yeah, I, I lost this. I lost this relationship. I might have lost a family member that I love. I, I, it may be an unthinkable tragedy, but God, you love me. Yeah. And I'm fully persuaded that nothing that can be brought against me in this earthly realm as I'm walking with you can separate me. Yeah. I'm persuaded. Yeah. So I'm going to share three scriptures with you guys, um, and we're going to address the rest of this question of love. If you could, please, and three more scriptures, I promise, just bear with me. John 15. John 15, verse 13, the question of love. Let's, let's lay this question to rest. John 15, verse 13, and this is Jesus talking. Oh, I like to take my time when Jesus is talking. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And I like that in this scripture is going on that Jesus will go forward and say, we his friends. Yeah. He laid down his life for us because we're his friends. Yeah. And what greater expression of love can he give us? Yeah. Let's turn to 1 John 4.19. 1 John 4.19. A lot of pages. Peter James John. First John four nineteen. Just good reminders. First John four nineteen. We love him because he first loved us. 
We love him because he first loved us. I think sometimes it's kind of easy for us to think, you know, um, I started loving God. That's why I came to him. And that's why. And it's just not true. We have to really anchor it in our soul that no matter what, we got to know he loved us first. You know, that who's on first situation. Like who, and the people actually think, what came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first, your love or God's love? God's love Amen. always came first. And really, if you think about it, before we was even here, before we even thought, before he even created, any, we were in his love. Yeah. So he was always going to be first because God is love. Yeah. He first loved us. Um, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Galatians. I'm sorry, I do speak my books of the Bible out loud to remember where things are. Galatians, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2. I used to um, do what are those things called, the Bible tabs? They would tear up. And like I used to put sticky notes in there too, but they would tear up. I'm like, I can't do it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you have he quickened, let's internalize this. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now work, that worketh now in the children of disobedience. Those who don't believe, those are still loving darkness rather than the light. That's all that really means. Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So I got to ask you, church family, what more convincing do you need? So Jesus has laid down his life. God has raised him from the dead. And beyond that, he's like, now, in Christ Jesus, I've given you a free gift. All you have to do is believe. And that simple belief, I made it easy, that simple belief will save you from condemnation. Not only that, his blood will cleanse you from all your guilt. And so, what more do you need? But God, I still don't have it all together. I already laid my life down for you. Well, God, I, I just can't do everything right now. I'm just still trying to figure out. Just give me some grace. Well, you, I already declared you righteous. Take the time that you need. God, I, I know it's been a long time. Maybe you can't use me anymore. My love is limitless. You know what? I, I gave my love way before you was even born, way before you even yeah, believed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what more do we need? Who can lay a charge against you? I want you to really reflect and think about that. What is keeping you feeling guilty? Oh, God, I fell in pornography again. And he says, I've already forgiven you. Go and sin no more. Fight. I would tell you, when I was going through my personal struggles and trying to come on the other side, Jesus was my inspiration. I said, Jesus, uh, I went and read the story, and it says that when Jesus, uh, he talked about um, he resisted to the point of blood. And as you're fighting and walking through this life with God and there's something you're struggling with, I encourage you, just say, you know what, Jesus loves me and I'm a struggle. And if I haven't struggled to the point of blood, I haven't struggled yet. Maybe we're playing around with some of the things that we're struggling with and we're not really fighting it, and we're not really bringing it to Jesus because if we bring it to Jesus, you don't got the power to overcome. Any temptation you can be delivered out of. And I'm telling you, you're only dealing with a defeated foe. So anything, if you're struggling, bring it to the Father. 
bring it at his feet. And you know, I, I get a lot of, you know, I'm with teenagers all the time. So they ask me a lot of stuff. They're just like, you know, well, why does the person do this? And why are they drinking? Why did they? And I tell you, listen, if you're struggling with any question and you don't understand some things or you might think, well, maybe that's not sin. I, I'm just saying, bring it to the father and ask him about you. You're like, maybe, it's, maybe God's not talking about a thing. Maybe because you haven't asked. Maybe because he knows you don't want to lay it at his feet. And guess what? He ain't going to beat you up. He's like, you know what? I, even if you went to the grave struggling and fighting or, or you didn't get everything, nobody got everything. Nobody's perfect. Nobody did every single thing. But man, the heart posture to know that I'm going to face God and say, I tried everything your word told me. Yeah. Everything. I didn't leave nothing on the table. I didn't sweep nothing under the rug. I just said, God, shine a light. Now that we know, you know, you know Paul, I'm going to revisit because that's my brother. I love Paul. Paul was a murderer. Yeah. This is a murderer that says, I'm fully persuaded. Yeah. Fully persuaded. A murderer. How can a person say that? How can a person say that? That, oh, yeah, um, I, I don't even look at my past. I don't have any guilt conscious and I murdered believers. Man, that's really resting in the blood of Jesus. That's really resting in the love of God. You got to be in a pretty special place with the Lord to say something like that. It sounds kind of like when Jesus was in the garden and he's saying, not my will, but yours be done. There's got to be a level of trust in that love that makes you say stuff like that. Not my will, but yours be done. I'm fully persuaded. Huh? And the faith, I'm fully persuaded in front of people that know. It ain't like, you know, I'm Paul, you know, nobody don't know me in here. You know, <laughs> he's like, you know, I'm just dropping an album next week. No. <laughs> People know him. He's known by reputation. And still could look in your face, look you in the eye and say, I did no man wrong. No man. So if we haven't strived to that level of knowing God's love for us, strive to that level of I don't have a guilt conscience. I don't have, I'm, I, I know I'm not condemned, then what have we really reached to? I shared with some of my teammates about, um, and I shared with you guys earlier about uh, just a right now, a right now relationship with God. I'm telling you, right now. Let's bring up stuff right now. Let's hear what God is saying to us right now. Let's see what God wants to lead us to right now. Right now. When's the last time you asked God, God, Shine a light on something for me to work on. Yeah. Or have we gotten so comfortable? I'm going to raise my hand because I know I got comfortable in quite a few areas. But have we gotten so comfortable where we're no longer pursuing God? Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be real honest about it. I presided one day, and I was just like, Lord, you know, I was really just thinking on all these scriptures and all this. Why was the only thing I could reach for was something that happened like four months ago? I was like, why, why, why is that? I'm like, where, where is the revelation? He's like, because you're not pursuing me for right now. Things are going so good that you're not even seeking me on what, what, what's the financial, what's the next thing? What, what, what's another thing to learn? I'm not letting him lead me and guide me in all things daily. So I got to reach back to the last time I was doing that. So. I encourage you. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm walking, I'm being transparent, but I'm walking this stuff out as you walking this stuff out. And I'm telling you, get right back in the saddle. I'm back in the saddle. Trust me, I'll be asking God all the time what I'm supposed to be doing with this money. But <laughs> <laughs> only the fully persuaded can say, say things like that. Only the fully persuaded can say things like, not my will, but thine be done. What more do you need to convince? So church, I'm not going to give you more than what I came to give you. That is what I came to give you. But I'm telling you, this is the revelation I got hearing this word on God's love. And I got to tell you, I done been through a lot of challenges in life, but nothing can separate me from the love of God. And I hope that each and every one of you, praise God, I hope that each and every one of you, as you continue walking with God, that nothing, 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 no one, no one can separate you from the love of God. Pursue God with all you got. If you don't understand something, take it back to the Father. If there's something you want to do, something that's hurting you, something that you got questions about, take it back to the Father. Take it back to the light. Let it be wrought before him. 
And I'm telling you, it's, you're unstoppable. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, if you are here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you. No other love you'll know like this. A love that doesn't let you down. A love that doesn't leave you or forsake you. A love that has you on his mind all the time. It numbers more than the sand of the sea. That is the kind of love we're inviting you to. And if you don't know him, we don't want you to go another day in condemnation. You know, 